Late at night, on November 25th, 1870, two bedraggled-looking men clutching a leather sack knocked on the office door of San Francisco businessman George Roberts. They explained to him that they had arrived in the city too late to put their parcel into the Bank of California, and asked him if he would be willing to put their bag in his safe for the night. Well, of course, that made Mr. Roberts wonder what was in the bag. The two men were tight-lipped, but George Roberts was a clever businessman, and he was able to wheedle some information out of them on the solemn promise that he would tell nobody else. Well, if the two men hoped that George Roberts would keep their secret, they would be sorely disappointed. He was apparently contacting friends almost the instant they left his office, because what was in the bag was simply too good a business opportunity for a man like George Roberts to ignore. The bag was filled with uncut gems, rubies, emeralds, sapphires, and lots and lots of diamonds. And the discovery of what was quite apparently the richest gem field in the Americas is a story that deserves to be remembered. Philip Arnold hailed from Elizabethtown, Kentucky. He was poorly educated. He had been an apprentice to become a hatter when he decided to enlist in the army to serve in the war against Mexico in 1845. After the war, he'd become one of the hundreds of thousands of 49ers who had come to California to strike it rich during the gold rush. He'd worked in mining operations throughout the West, making enough money to buy a farm and start a family in his native Kentucky, although he continued to work in the West and only returned home periodically. In 1870, Arnold left his job working for a company that manufactured drill bits for mining and went to partner with his cousin, a man named John Slack, who was also a veteran of the Mexican War and also a 49er, and the two of them had worked together at a silver mine in New Mexico, and they went out to seek their fortune in diamonds. And by November of that year, the two prospectors had managed to fill a bag with uncut diamonds, and George Roberts, the man upon whose door they had knocked, wanted a piece of the action. One of the first people that Roberts contacted was William Chapman Ralston, one of the richest men in San Francisco and the founder of the Bank of California. And Ralston contacted a colorful mining financier named Asbury Harpending, who had been involved in mining in the West, to manage the project. Before they knew it, the two backcountry prospectors had some of the richest people in San Francisco asking to be their partners. Harpending said of them they had all the manner of a couple of simple-minded fellows who had stumbled upon something great and, bewildered by their good fortune, were simply afraid to trust anyone with their momentous secret. But the promise of more money than they could ever imagine was too much to pass up, and they sold 50% of their stake. They were given an advance of $50,000, roughly the equivalent of $900,000 today, and told to go back to the mine and bring back more gems as proof of its value. They returned in the summer of 1871 with a burlap bag brimming with gemstones. Harpending took the bag to a meeting of the investors, dumping them on the table in what he described as a dazzling many-colored cataract of light. They sent 10% of the jewels to New York to be appraised by the most knowledgeable jeweler in America, Charles Louis Tiffany, the world-famous founder of Tiffany & Company. According to Harpending, Tiffany's assessment was, Gentlemen, these are beyond question precious stones of enormous value. Eventually, he estimated the value of the gems, just 10% of those that Arnold and Slack had brought back that summer, at $150,000, making the whole bag worth a staggering $1.5 million. The group then rec recruited more investors, notably George B. McClellan, who had been commander of the Army of the Potomac during the Civil War and had once run for president, and Benjamin Franklin Butler, who had been a major general during the Civil War and was now a congressman, who would be helpful, the investors considered, in securing the land if the gem field turned out to be on federal property. Now more than ever, the wealthy group of investors wanted to buy out the two Kentucky miners who had discovered the gems. They gave them another $150,000 on the promise that they would bring a bona fide mining inspector to inspect the claim. Harpending engaged Henry Jannon, of whom he said, as a great mine expert and consulting engineer, he was without peer in the United States, perhaps in the world. In June of 1872, Jannon and Harpending traveled with Arnold and Slack by train from St. Louis to the tiny town of Rawlins, Wyoming. There they had a grueling four-day trek to the site. What they found there amazed them. They found a high mountain mesa where diamonds could literally be discovered merely by kicking the dirt. Harpending said, For more than an hour, diamonds were being found in profusion, together with occasional rubies, emeralds, and sapphires. Jannon assured me that the discovery location alone, which we had partially examined, was certainly worth many million dollars. The investors quickly bought out Arnold and Slack. They received another $150,000 and then sold out some $300,000 in stock. Their total take was some $650,000, nearly $12 million in 2018 dollars. That was a tidy sum, but nothing compared to the value of the gem field. The wily bankers had taken the claim from the miners who found it, for a steal. As Harpender noted, thus the decks were cleared. But even they did not have a real appreciation of the value of their claim. That actually occurred by coincidence. 
Janin happened to run into a team of government geologists, including Clarence King, on the train from Oakland. King was a Yale-trained geologist who was in charge of an immense federal mapping project called the 40th Parallel Survey. They decided to visit the site in October of 1872. They too were amazed as raw gemstones were easily found laying about. They were able to survey more thoroughly and even dug a 10 foot deep trench where the greatest diamond deposit should be. What they found astounded them. They rushed back to San Francisco to tell the new owners of their discovery. On November 11th, 1872, they told the startled investors the amazing news they had about their famous gem claim. It was utterly worthless. The gems had been scattered about, salted in order to fool investors. Some of the wealthiest men in America had been taken to the cleaners by a couple of backcountry rubes. Philip Arnold might not have had a lot of education, but he was no dummy. He hadn't stumbled upon George Roberts' business by mistake. He knew exactly who George Roberts was and exactly to whom he was connected. And he knew the best way to get George Roberts to sink the hook on their con was to get him to solemnly promise not to tell anybody else. They had gotten the diamonds to bait the con from Arnold's former employer. He worked for a company that made drill bits. Diamond drill bits. Diamond drills used chips of low quality industrial grade diamonds, and he had stolen the raw diamonds from there. He and his cousin had then added raw gems, opals, emeralds, rubies, and sapphires they had bought from Native Americans when they had been miners in New Mexico. When they got that first $50,000 advance, they hadn't gone back to the mine to mine diamonds. They'd hopped a ship for London and, under assumed names, bought thousands of low quality uncut diamonds on the market for just $20,000. And then Charles Tiffany valued just a tenth of those at being worth over $150,000. They used some of their next advance to purchase more stones to salt about a half acre of ground in far northeastern Colorado, near a low mountain still called Diamond Peak. And those had fooled their investors. But how did they do it? How had they fooled a respected mining engineer and the most knowledgeable jeweler on the continent? It turns out Charles Tiffany and his lapidary actually had almost no experience with uncut stones. The stones were almost exclusively cut in Europe and had appraised them as if they were far higher quality than they really were. And Henry Jannon, assured by Tiffany's valuation, didn't even consider fraud. In addition, the mine engineer had been promised an option to buy a thousand shares of company stock, shares that would have been worthless had the find been fake. The thought does not seem to have even crossed his mind. All the experts' confidence reinforced each other. Philip Arnold moved back to Kentucky, where he bought 500 acres of land that he put in his wife's name. The two were indicted for fraud by a grand jury, but the investors were too embarrassed to pursue criminal charges. Arnold denied that he had salted the claim, but he did end up settling with one of the investors for $150,000. But that means he still came out far ahead on the deal. He died of pneumonia in 1878. John Slack seemed to disappear, but a 1967 book on the Great Diamond Hoax asserted that he became an undertaker and died in New Mexico in 1896. Well, that's unproven, but if it's true, it raises an interesting question, because the man who died in 1896 only left his family about a thousand dollars, and that means what happened to the rest of the money that he made in the Great Diamond Scan. To understand why this could happen so easily, you do have to understand the period. These investors had made millions of dollars on the California gold rush. They had great faith that the mineral values of the Western United States could bring untold wealth. They had seen it happen. It was all too easy to believe. Far too easy, it seems, because emeralds, sapphires, and rubies had nowhere else in the world been found alongside diamonds. According to Harpender, that fact ought to have made a goat do some responsible thinking. Of course, the hero of the story is Clarence King, the Yale-trained government geologist. He became famous for his role uncovering the Great Diamond Hoax and was one of the great geologists in American history. His survey mapped an extensive part of the West between the Rocky Mountains and the Sierras. He authored several famous books and three mountains are named after him. In 1879, when Congress consolidated all the national surveys and created the United States Geological Survey, he was named as its first director. He died of tuberculosis in 1901 at the age of 59. It's hard to figure out what lesson to take from the great diamond hoax of 1872. There is some delicious irony in two Kentucky rubes fooling some of the most prominent men of the day, but crime pays is never a good lesson to take. Maybe the best lesson is that science wins in the end? In any case, it is a ripping yarn, history, that deserves to be remembered. The Nickel. Since 1938, the front has borne an image of Thomas Jefferson, third president of the United States. The reverse usually shows a picture of his home, Monticello, although there were special editions minted in 2004 and 2005 to commemorate the 200th anniversary of the Louisiana Purchase and the Lewis and Clark expedition. In, in a world where we barely use change anymore at all, nickels don't seem to gain a lot of attention, but that wasn't always the case.
1883, a new nickel design was minted that gave the United States Mint great consternation and led to fraud all over the country. And one of the most famous fraudsters of the 1883 racketeer nickel was said to be both deaf and mute, which essentially helped him to perpetrate his fraud. It is history that deserves to be remembered. Counterfeiting is nearly as old as coinage. Around 600 BC, ancient Lydians minted coins out of electrum, a naturally occurring gold and silver alloy believed to be among the oldest coins ever minted. Greek historian Herodotus credits them as the first people to use gold and silver coins, although historically that is a matter of debate. Even these ancient coins seem to have been counterfeited as versions with base metal cores plated with electrum, gold, or silver have been found. In the early modern period, coins were often clipped or shaved for the precious metal, which was always of value. Coins were given reeded edges specifically to prevent people from passing off shaved coins. The first American coins with reeded edges were struck in the 1790s on half dimes. They weren't yet known as a nickel, as well as on larger coins. But a good counterfeiter or fraudster was always on the lookout for an opportunity. From the 1790s, American coins were minted in a variety of denominations, including the half-cent, two-cent, and three-cent pieces, up to the gold $2.50 quarter eagle, the $5 half eagle, and the $10 eagle coins. Most of these coins were made of varying amounts of precious metal, usually gold or silver, with lower denominations made of copper. Half-dimes, valued at five cents, were originally silver, which changed in the 1860s thanks to lobbying efforts by Joseph Wharton, who had a near monopoly on nickel production in the United States. He successfully lobbied for the three cent piece and the five cent piece to be made with copper nickel, leading to the James Longacre designed shield nickels. Shield nickels were only legal tender up to one dollar initially, and that combined with a widely criticized design led to numerous suggestions for change. The American Journal of Numismatics even described the shield nickel as the ugliest of all known coins. The shield nickel is also what would eventually lead to the term nickel to describe a five cent piece. It's not actually the first coin to include nickel. In 1857, the mint had shifted penny production to an alloy of 88% copper and 12% nickel. These nickel pennies were the first coins to be called nickels in the United States, differentiating them from the most coinage made of gold or silver. Besides Wharton's lobbying, there were other good reasons by 1866 to make coins out of base metals. During the Civil War, commerce slowed dramatically, in large part because Americans began hoarding gold and silver coins, which would hold value regardless of inflation. This caused both the Union and the Confederacy to issue paper money in cent denominations. Some banks even printed their own paper money so that commerce could continue. The issue of scarcity and hoarding continued after the Civil War. The Mint simply could not keep up with demand for coinage. Thus, in 1866, the Mint began producing three and five cent pieces made of 25% nickel and 75% copper. However, the nickel was not the only five cent piece to be minted during this time. Silver half dimes continued to be minted until 1873. Both the five cent piece and the three cent piece could be called nickels after that, as they were the only coins made from the material. In the years immediately after the Civil War, these coins were minted in huge numbers, nearly 15 million in 1866 and over 30 million in 1867. So many of the coins were minted that by the late 1870s, the glut of coinage forced the mint to cease minting five cent nickels completely. None were minted for circulation in 1877 or 1878, and fewer than 70,000 were minted in 1879, 80, and 81. Wharton, seeking to sell more of his nickel to the government, began lobbying for more coins to be made out of nickel. Wharton hoped to convince the mint to shift pennies to copper nickel as they were being minted in much larger numbers. By 1881, his consistent lobbying led Mint Superintendent Archibald Loudon Snowden to order new designs for the one, three, and five cent pieces from the Mint's engraver, Charles Barber. Barber was given very specific instructions on his designs. The obverse, the head side, was to have a classic Liberty head, while the reverse was to feature a wreath around a Roman numeral denoting the value V for the five cent piece. The nickel was also to be slightly larger than the shield nickel. The smaller denomination coins were meant to be identical except for size and the Roman numerals on the reverse, but early in the design process, development of the penny and the three cent piece were abandoned and only a new nickel design was produced. A large number of pattern coins, coins that were not released but used to evaluate the design, which was modified slightly before being approved and sent to the Treasury Secretary. The initial design was actually rejected as the words United States of America appeared on the head side of the coin and coinage statutes actually required it to be on the reverse. While other issues had been considered, one thing the coin did not have when it was approved was the word sense. The mint could be excused for admitting it. Early silver and copper nickel designs in three cent pieces didn't say cents and had circulated for years without complaint. 
the coin was meant to start minting in 1883, but the dies for striking the coins weren't ready in time, and so throughout January the Philadelphia Mint struck nearly a million and a half 1883 shield nickels. The new design was finally released in February, and almost immediately others noticed that the coins were problematic. On February 11th, the New York Times published a press release from Washington, D.C. that stated, Chief Brooks of the Secret Service says that he regards the new nickels as very dangerous coins. A thin plating would enable persons to pass them off as gold coins of a new issue. The problem arose from the new nickel's similarity to the $5 gold half eagle coin. Both bore a Liberty Head design on the front and were nearly the same size. 21.21 millimeters for the nickel and 21.6 millimeters for the half eagle. The reverse of the half eagle was an eagle behind a shield, but a gold plated nickel was nearly the same weight and size, and if only glanced at, could easily be passed off at a hundred times its value. And there were enough clever people to take advantage. The most famous story of fraud using gold plated nickels is that of Josh Tatum, a deaf mute purportedly from Boston. Depending on the source, Tatum was said to have collected a good number of the new nickels before enlisting someone, usually a pawn shop owner who may have been an amateur jeweler, to plate the change. The Palladium Item newspaper of Richmond, Indiana relates that carrying the thousand plated nickels in a small black bag and looking respectable with a mustache and balding head, he would enter a tobacco store, place the coin on the counter, and point to a five cent cigar. The clerk would grab the cigar and hand it and four dollars and ninety-five cents in change back. Tatum would then move on to the next door. He eventually had more plated, making his way from Boston to New York and hitting every shop that sold a cigar. By some claims, he was able to make fifteen thousand dollars on the scheme before someone caught up to him and he was arrested. But there was an issue. When he was taken to court by the store owners he had cheated, they couldn't convict him. When each witness who had been cheated out of four dollars and ninety-five cents was asked if Tatum had ever asked for change, each witness had to say no. The man was mute. By asking for only a five cent cigar, Tatum could claim that he never misrepresented the coin. It was the seller's mistake giving him change. A coin collector explained to the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, the shop owners were simply out of luck thanks to carelessness. It's been claimed that this act is the source of the phrase, just joshing you, to mean usually a harmless joke or prank. The first certain report of gold-plated Liberty Nickels appeared only 12 days after the coins were first issued. The new five-cent coins are so perfectly gold-washed as to deceive any ignorant persons and pass readily among them for new $5 gold pieces, reported another press release. The Baltimore Sun reported on the February 19th that a gold-plated five-cent piece of the new issue has reached the Sun office, and its resemblance to a five-dollar gold piece is quite enough to deceive. Four days later, the Charlotte Observer in North Carolina reported that the merchants who had seen the nickel give the authorities credit for their wisdom in stopping the coinage of the dangerous piece. But others were less understanding. The Intelligencer Journal of Lancaster, Pennsylvania printed, Someone about the Philadelphia Mint has a mania for putting new faces on coins. And unfortunately, good judgment and good taste seldom attend the performance. Only two weeks after their introduction, there was already talk at the Mint and the Treasury Department about withdrawing the new coins from circulation. Treasury Secretary Charles Folger seems to have believed that unnecessary, but reports continued to proliferate that the coin was being used for fraud. Secret Service agent Henry Finnegas arrested a man for trying to pass off a gold nickel across the country in San Francisco. Finnegas also reported that several persons engaged in the gold and silver plating business in this city have called upon me to ascertain if they could gild the new five cent nickel without my interfering with them. Archibald Loudon Snowden, chief executor of the Mint, fought the change as well, arguing that no one had plated the three cent piece and passed it off for the quarter eagle. But it hardly mattered. By March, the decision had been made to alter the design to include cents on the reverse. Though the York Dispatch of York, Pennsylvania reported that minting of the no cents nickel continued, with nearly $5,000 being minted in Philadelphia every day. Papers across the country reported, however, that the no cents coins would be collected by the mint to be destroyed. The new design finally began minting on June 26, but only after 5,479,519 no cents coins had been minted. Because of the reports that the coin would be recalled, many of those 5 million were hoarded by collectors who believed the coin would be valuable. Ironically, because so many of them were saved, high-quality no-sense nickels are relatively common, while high-quality sense nickels are considerably more rare. It might disappoint you to find out that the famous story of Josh Tatum is likely nothing more than legend. The coin was certainly plated, and likely used in schemes similar to the one attributed to Tatum, but he doesn't appear as any of the men arrested across the country for the scheme. More importantly, his story doesn't appear in any contemporary newspaper account. The story seems to have proliferated in 1965, when it appeared in multiple papers on articles about coin shows. 
but possibly the earliest version appears in the Southwest Times of Pulaski, Virginia on December 14th, 1958, told by a Miss Willie Long. It isn't clear where she heard the story. Even more disappointing, the story is definitely not the origin of the phrase, just joshing you. In fact, the phrase's origin is uncertain, but Merriam-Webster dates its origin to at least 1845, well before Tatum's supposed exploits. The phrase has also been suggested to come from humorist Josh Billings, the pen name of Henry Wheeler Shaw, whose career began in 1858. The origin of the phrase is, unfortunately, simply unknown. While the story of Josh Tatum might be purely legend, the fraud surrounding the controversial no-sense nickel was very real, and since then the nickel has come to be commonly called the racketeer nickel. Liberty nickels were produced clear until 1912, and they were replaced officially by the buffalo nickel, but no buffalo nickels were actually minted that year, and there are 1913 examples of the Liberty head nickel. Nickels became more popular in the 20th century, partly because of the proliferation of movie machines that were coin-operated and asked for five cents, called, of course, a Nickelodeon. And while today methods of preventing fraud and counterfeiting are much more sophisticated than they once were, the 1883 racketeer nickel is still a cautionary tale. Fraudsters will take their chances wherever they can. For thousands of years, some people in the Irish countryside believed in fairies, which they called the good people, or sometimes just the people. Sophisticated folklores arose around these magical creatures that supposedly lived in the other realm. Children would be warned not to go near a solitary thorn bush, not to cut down certain trees, not to follow music that emanated from wild places, else they might be abducted by the fairies and taken to their magical realm under the hills, never to return. Or even worse, they might return, but it wouldn't be them. It would be a fairy changeling, which while it looked like them and talked like them, was actually a monster underneath the skin. In 1895, an Irish barrel maker named Michael Cleary became convinced that his wife, Bridget Boland Cleary, was showing signs of fairy abduction, and he was determined to bring her back. And what happened next represented the clash between Catholicism and paganism, and ushering out the old superstitions to make way for the modern era. It is history that deserves to be remembered. Ireland in the 1890s was a land that was changing, not just politically and economically, but also moving away from pagan superstitions into the modern era of technology, medicine, and science. Fifty years before, the country had survived what was called the Great Famine. When the potato crop failed multiple years in a row, thousands of laboring Irish starved. It was the worst famine in Europe of the 19th century. Experts estimate nearly a million Irish died from starvation or related diseases, and another two million left the country. Land became consolidated in the hands of the wealthy. Tenant farmers who found themselves unable to pay rent were evicted and left homeless. Eyewitnesses from that era described families dead in ditches, their mouths stained green from attempting to subsist on grass. A movement began for home rule for Ireland, partly driven by demands for land reform that were the result of the demographic changes of the Great Famine. The question of home rule deeply divided Ireland. The nationalists, as they called themselves, believed no one could govern the people as well as the people themselves. However, their opposition in Parliament, the Unionists, thought that Ireland could not govern themselves. Some of them pointed to an uneducated and stereotypical belief in nonsense like fairies as additional reasons to oppose home rule. Irish culture was much affected by the events of the day. The death and migration caused by the Great Famine had devastated the Irish-speaking areas of the country, which tended also to be rural and poor. Starting in the 1830s, national schools had been established in an attempt to decrease illiteracy, but the instruction was done in English, further eroding the Irish language and culture. By 1900, for the first time in millennia, Irish was not the majority language of Ireland. The Catholic Church also played a role. The first cardinal in Ireland, Cardinal Paul Cullen, pressed for participation in processions, pilgrimages, wakes, and more to encourage former pagans to embrace the Catholic religion. Spearheaded from Rome, the Catholic Church in Ireland encouraged regular attendance and communion and mass. But despite these massive changes, some of the rural populace continued to believe in fairies, and some in the church chose simply to look the other way. Michael and Bridget Cleary were childless, something that was a rather an oddity in 1890s rural Ireland. While Michael worked his trade as a cooper, Bridget sold eggs from hens in her backyard and also sewed, owning her own Singer sewing machine, which was also unusual. 
The young couple lived with Bridget's parents in a cottage with a main room, two small bedrooms, and a fireplace with a built-in grill made of iron. One story about Bridget, which may or may not be true, shows what people believed about her personality. One day, Bridget was outside straining potatoes, and the parish priest went riding by. When her dog, named Badger, bit at the priest's horse, he kicked at the dog and ordered Bridget to call it back. Bridget was incensed by the priest's behavior and threw the boiling water and potatoes at him. The priest cursed her for her actions and predicted she would die violently by fire. Folklore around fairies ran deep in some communities, including the small Irish village of Ballyvaday, where the Clarys lived. When a dining family dropped food from their table, they'd leave part of it for the fairies. They'd set a pail of milk on the steps of their homes to appease any thirsty fairies. When throwing out trash after the sun went down, they'd call out to warn any passing fairies. And when someone went missing, the community would say that the person had gone with the fairies. In March 1895, Michael Cleary was concerned because his wife, Bridget, had been spending what he believed to be an inappropriate amount of time wandering around a, a fairy fort on a hill called Kailagrana near their home. Fairy forts are rings of stones left from an earlier civilization. Bridget's reason for going on long walks to the hill are not known. She did not keep a diary, though she had been educated at one of the national schools since the age of four and was certainly literate. Maybe she walked to get some fresh air, or maybe she went to the fairies seeking a cure for her seeming infertility, or maybe strong-willed Bridget did it to defy her husband, who constantly harassed her about her walks to the fairy fort. After one such walk, Bridget Cleary returned home saying that she was feeling ill and not quite feeling herself, and her husband Michael jumped to the conclusion that she had gone with the fairies and had been replaced by a fairy changeling. The tradition of fairy changelings may harken back to early history, when pre-Celtic tribes lived underground in order to escape the better equipped Celts. Sometimes they would kidnap children who would go on to escape and talk about living with the people under the hill. Or it could be an oral tradition about the Druids who went into hiding after invasions and persecutions by the Romans. They would recruit young people to learn their secret ways, and if the person ever returned home, they had vowed not to reveal either the location or the secrets of the Druids. Whatever the origins of the changeling tale, Michael suspected his wife. At the time, the community described Bridget as a handsome, well-favored young woman of medium height, fresh complexion, with very dark wavy hair, beautiful eyes, and pleasing expression. She was rarely ill. Clearly also thought this sickly person seemed two inches taller than his actual wife, Bridget. In reality, Bridget might have contracted bronchitis, or the flu, or even tuberculosis, which had a social stigma, and so families with members who contracted tuberculosis would try to hide that fact. Some historians have suggested that possibly she had been meeting a lover up at the fairy ring, and her demeanor changed as the affair went sour. At first, Michael Cleary sought the help of traditional medicine and the church to cure his wife. A doctor came to the cottage and left some medicine for her to take. A priest also came at Michael's urging and saw that Bridget, though still healthy, was definitely suffering. For reasons he never fully explained, the priest gave Bridget her last rites and left. Michael took this as evidence that Bridget was dying. So he again sought help, this time from a traditional healer known for his fairy cures. Dennis Ganey prescribed herbs or unusual cures for people who came to him, and when Michael Cleary came to him begging for help with his wife replaced by a changeling, Ganey gave him a mix of herbs that was supposed to drive the changeling out. We don't really know what was in those herbs, but when you look at traditional Irish folklore, it was usually some bitter mix of filth and human urine. Michael Cleary called in help from the village, including Bridget's four male cousins, a female cousin, and a half dozen neighbors. He forced the bitter-tasting herbs down Bridget's throat until she begged for him to stop. Later, eyewitnesses said he would scream, Swallow it, you devil! He clapped his hands and made her answer three times, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, Are you Bridget, the wife of Michael Cleary? Believing invoking holy names and the power of the three would drive out the changeling. He threw urine on his wife in an effort to purify her body of the unclean spirit. And when she refused to take the herbs, Michael and another Bridget's male relatives, John Dunn, threatened her with a red-hot poker. The abuse went on for hours, over the course of days. Finally, when Michael was convinced he could do nothing else, he threatened to burn Bridget over the fire. Another changeling tale said fairies could not abide fire and would rush out of the afflicted person's body at its touch. Michael put her over the fire and again asked if she was his wife. She said yes. Bridget's own father, Patrick Boland, held her over the fire and asked if she was his daughter. Bridget replied, I am, Dada. 
Her family was convinced and removed her from the fire. However, Michael Clary didn't believe he had his wife back. He called the priest back yet again and asked that Bridget be given communion. The superstition was that if she was still a changeling, she would be unable to take the holy wafer in her mouth. Another of Bridget's cousins, Joanna Burke, said Bridget took the wafer but did not swallow it, spitting it out after the ritual was completed. This small final rebellion may have sealed Bridget's fate. Michael again asked her three times if she was his wife. She answered the first two times but refused to answer the third. Clary threw Bridget towards the fireplace and she struck her head on the stones at the hearth. Then he pulled out a brand from the fire and threatened her once more. Some witnesses claim by using a phrase that has become an Irish children's rhyme. Are you a witch? Are you a fairy? Are you the wife of Michael Clary? When she was silent, he threw lamp oil on her and folded her into the fireplace where she began to burn. It's not my wife, Michael reportedly said while she burned. I am not going to keep an old witch in place of my wife, so I must get back my wife. When her family protested, he held them back, saying that in a moment we'll hear the spirit escape up the chimney. But the cottage was silent, and Bridget Cleary was dead. For days after the murder, the family testified that Michael went to the fairy fort, praying he would see his wife ride by on a great horse so he could steal her back from the fairies. After a few days of fruitless searching, one of Bridget's family members took Michael to the local church, where he confessed to burning his wife. Though I didn't mean it by God, he said. Bridget Cleary was not the only person to be murdered in Ireland in the 19th century in the name of changeling folklore. In 1885, when Michael Leahy of County Kerry could neither walk nor talk by the age of four, instead of understanding that he had a disability, his grandmother assumed that he was a fairy changeling and drowned him in a river trying to chase the fairy out. She was charged with murder but acquitted of the crime. Nine people were charged with the torture and murder of Bridget Cleary. Her husband, Michael Cleary, convicted not of murder but of manslaughter, received the harshest sentence, 20 years hard labor. The others were convicted of the crime of wounding and served lesser sentences. Even as he was being sentenced, Michael Cleary insisted that he was innocent, that he had not burned his wife, but instead had burned a fairy. But he had a change of heart in prison and eventually argued to a board of parole that he had been confused by his wife's family's ramblings about fairies. He was released after 15 years in 1910, immigrated to Montreal, Canada, and was lost to history. Of course, Unionists argued that this was an argument against Irish independence. One newspaper called it the Tipperary Horror and argued that Ireland and all of her civilization and all of her people should not be given over to a peasant-elected Irish parliament. The question of Irish independence remained contentious and eventually would spur open warfare. Bridget Cleary was brutally tortured over a matter of days. She's been called the last witch to be burned in Ireland, but of course that's not necessarily true. She wasn't accused of being a witch or consorting with the devil. She was accused of being a fairy changeling, and her brutal torture and murder represent the clash between those ancient superstitions and the modern era. Her badly burned body was buried next to her mother along the wall of the village cemetery. The grave is unmarked except for a few rounded stones. Long considered to be the most northern of the southern states and the most southern of the northern states, West Virginia is a state known for its scenic vistas and mountain views, but it could be just as well known for its unique history. For example, it was in West Virginia that the United States built a bunker that was designed to protect the United States Congress in the case of nuclear war. The more than 100,000 square foot facility built more than 700 feet below the Greenbrier Hotel in Sulphur Springs, West Virginia, was completed in 1961 and remained active clear until the 1990s when the Washington Post revealed its existence and it was decommissioned. And there is another piece of nearly forgotten American history that also occurred in Greenbrier County. This one in the 1890s. Because the curious story of one of the only known trials in history to include the testimony of a ghost deserves to be remembered. West Virginia joined the Union during the Civil War, splitting from the rest of Virginia, which joined the Confederacy. However, the people living in what would become West Virginia desired separate statehood long before that fatal break. There were differences in ethnicity and views about what constituted appropriate taxation and government representation, among other issues. About one-third of the population of Virginia lived in its western counties. When the Virginia legislature voted to secede from the Union in 1861, the overall vote was 88 to 55. Of the 55 dissenters, 29 of the representatives were from West Virginia. 
In response to the vote, and outraged at the result, two conventions were held in Wheeling in which a separate pro-Union government was elected. The new governor was Francis H. Pierpont, and he made the new state capital of what was called the Restored Government of Virginia in Wheeling, later moving it to Alexandria. In April the following year, a referendum was held, both upholding the new government and putting forth a resolution to split from the rest of Virginia. The vote was extremely popular, with a final vote of 18,862 to 514. President Abraham Lincoln wrote to Pierpont, advising, Make haste slowly. Things are improving by time. Draw up your proclamation carefully, and if you please, let me see it before issuing. The vote in the U.S. Congress to allow statehood ran along party lines, but the formation of West Virginia was approved. There was some concern about slavery in the new state, as Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation specifically only applied to those states in rebellion against the Union. But a senator named Waitman Wiley, one of the founders of West Virginia and a slave owner himself, crafted an amendment creating gradual emancipation for the slaves within the proposed state's counties. That amendment was approved by the voters, and statehood moved forward. On April 20th, 1863, Abraham Lincoln announced that West Virginia would become a state after a 60-day waiting period. On June 20th, the 35th state joined the Union. Elva Zona Hester was born in West Virginia in 1873, 10 years after its formation. Not much is known about her life other than what survives through oral tradition. She was a bit of a free spirit for the time period, having a child out of wedlock in 1895. The next year, Zona met a blacksmith by the name of Erasmus Stribling Shoe, who was going by the name of Edward, but people in the town called him Trout. Shoe was more than a decade older than Zona. They had a whirlwind courtship and married in November 1896. By all accounts, the couple seemed to be happy and in love. However, Zona's mother, Mary Jane Robinson Heaster, reportedly had her doubts, both about the man and the short courtship. Then, in January of the next year, an 11-year-old neighbor who helped Zona around the house discovered her body at the foot of the stairs in her home. Reports from the time described the scene. The body was lying stretched out, perfectly straight, with feet together, one hand lying by the side and the other lying across the body. The head was slightly inclined to one side. He ran home to tell his mother, who summoned the doctor, police, and Edward Shue. By the time the doctor, George Knapp, got to the house, Shue had already taken his wife's body to a bedroom and dressed her for burial. He was cradling Zona's head and shoulders in his arms and rocking with grief. Knapp made a brief examination and declared Zona's death was due to an everlasting faint, what more modern doctors call a heart attack. According to some reports, the doctor later changed the cause of death to complications due to pregnancy, but Zona hadn't told anybody that she was pregnant and wasn't showing any signs of pregnancy at the time. Shu dressed his deceased bride in a high-collared dress himself. This was a break with tradition, as women from the community would usually prepare a body for burial. Her, he placed her body in a coffin, and Zona's remains were transported to her mother, Mary Jane Heaster's home, which was a few miles away on Big Sewell Mountain. Oddly, during the viewing of Zona's body, Shu did not leave his wife's side, remaining close to her casket and grieving, seeming to keep mourners from viewing the body too closely. But Mary Heaster did not trust Trout Shu, and she did not believe that her daughter had simply dropped dead of a heart attack. She began to pray that her daughter's spirit would return and tell her how she died. Some four weeks after her daughter's funeral, Mary said she began to have visions at night of Zona's spirit. Four nights in a row, Mary said her child appeared to her and claimed she had been abused by Shu. Zona's spirit said Shu was abusive. She said he had choked her, crushing her windpipe and breaking the top vertebrae in her neck. Mary said one night, as her daughter's spirit departed, Zona turned her head completely around, displaying the damage that had been done to her physical body. At first, no one believed Mary's ghostly tale, thinking it was simply a mother's grief, but Mary convinced her neighbors and her brother of its truth, and together they approached a lawyer named John Alfred Preston. He didn't believe Mary right away, but after Preston spoke to Dr. Knapp, who said that he had not closely examined Zona's body, and some of the neighbors described Shu's strange behavior at the visitation, he obtained a warrant to exhume Zona's body for an autopsy. The body was exhumed on February 22nd, 1897. Shu was required to attend the autopsy, though he protested. According to oral tradition, he said, But they will not be able to prove that I did it. A later story, printed by the Monroe Watchman newspaper, said Shu sat whittling on a stick while his wife's body was examined. It reported, He seemed unconcerned until the doctor started working around her neck, when Shu showed signs of extreme nervousness. 
Shockingly, the story purportedly told by Zona's ghost about her cause of death was confirmed. The autopsy showed that her neck had been broken and her windpipe crushed, showing that she had been strangled. Edward Trout Shoe was arrested for his wife's murder. The trial took place in June 1897. Prosecutors didn't want Mary to speak about her ghostly visions, but the defense asked about them, hoping to discredit her. But Mary stuck to her story and insisted it was true, and it was compelling. Judge J.W. McWhorter, who presided over the trial, described Mary's testimony on the stand in a letter to a friend after the event. McWhorter wrote what Mary claimed her daughter told her on the third night of her appearance. I told him supper was ready, and he began to chide me because I had prepared no meat for supper. And I reminded him that there was plenty. There was bread and butter, applesauce, preserves, and other things that made a very good supper. And he flew mad and got up and came towards me. When I raised up, he seized each side of my head with his hands, and by a sudden wrench, dislocated my neck. The judge went on to relate how Mary had kept a sheet that had been wadded around Zona's neck in her coffin. But it began to smell, and when she washed it, a red liquid oozed out and dyed the sheet. The sheet was displayed in court, and the judge said it was a decidedly reddish color. McWhorter said that he had never been to Zona's home, and neither had Mary. But Zona's spirit described the place in such detail that when he spoke to a friend about its location, based on Mary's testimony alone, they believed he had been there. Finally, he wrote that Shu had been heard to say that he wanted to be married seven times in his life. It was revealed during the trial that Shu had been married twice before his final marriage to Zona. His first wife divorced him and listed in the court documents that he had been abusive. Shu's second wife died under mysterious circumstances within a year of their nuptials. One story said she had fallen through ice. Another suggests she died when Shu accidentally dropped a brick on her head as they built a chimney. And it was revealed that between the two marriages, Shu had spent two years in prison for stealing a horse. Shu took the stand at his own defense during the proceedings. A local newspaper, the Greenbrier Independent, reported he admitted that he had served a turn in the pan, declared that he dearly loved his wife, and appealed to the jury to look into his face and then say if he was guilty. His testimony, manner, and so forth made an unfavorable impression on the spectators. He denied the circumstantial evidence arrayed against him, but the jury was convinced otherwise. The trial only lasted eight days, and deliberations went on for a little more than an hour. Judge McWhorter could not instruct the jury to ignore the testimony about the ghost, because it had been brought up by the defense, not the prosecution. Shu was found guilty of first-degree murder. Most of the jury thought he deserved the death penalty, but it was not unanimous, so he was instead sentenced to life in prison. Following the trial in July, a lynch mob formed to hang Shu, but authorities heard about the mob and the sheriff was able to protect him by hiding him in the woods. Shu was said to be so terrified of the mob that he was unable to tie his own shoes. The sheriff confronted the mob and persuaded them to lay down their arms and go home. Four of them were later indicted for attempted lynching. Shu was imprisoned at the state prison in Moundsville. He died of an unknown epidemic that went through the prison population in March 1900 and was buried in an unmarked grave. Mary Hester maintained throughout the rest of her life that she had been visited by her daughter's ghost. She died in September 1916. Of course, people still argue whether Edward Chu was guilty, but it's rather amazing that Zona Chu's actual cause of death was uncovered. Still, it's hard to believe that as late as 1897 that a U.S. jury took the testimony of a ghost as credible evidence, uh, although it was supported by a strong circumstantial case. On U.S. Highway 60, in front of Sam Black Church in West Virginia, there is a sign commemorating Zona Shu. It reads in part, Interned in nearby cemetery is Zona Hester Shu. Her death was presumed to be natural until her spirit visited her mother to describe how she had been killed by her husband, Edward. It's always surprising when history mimics fiction. There have been literally hundreds of science fiction novels and movies about alien invaders attacking the Earth, but one winter day in Boston, the city literally found itself under attack by little men from the moon and the city had to deploy all its considerable resources to beat back the attack, while local and national news reported breathlessly on the battle. It is history so bizarre that it simply deserves to be remembered. Boston was in the midst of rush hour, approximately 8 in the morning on Wednesday, January 31st, 2007, 
when a worker from the Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority noticed a suspicious object attached to a stanchion supporting a raised section of ramp onto Interstate 93 and a subway and bus station near Sullivan Square in Charleston, a neighborhood north of the Charles River across from downtown Boston. The U.S. was a changed nation after the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, and that was particularly true in Boston. The two airplanes that had taken down the Twin Towers had taken off from Boston's Logan International Airport. Cities across the country were on high alert, and this, this object, or rather device, a rectangle approximately one by one and a half feet, clearly didn't belong there. It had a circuit board, it had wires coming out of the side, and ominously, it had D-cell batteries taped along the side. The MBTA worker didn't know what it was, but a device of unknown purpose attached to a stanchion supporting a major highway raised an obvious concern. Unsure whether the device represented a threat, the MBTA shut down part of the Boston subway's Orange Line, the beginning of a difficult day for Boston commuters. According to the MBTA website, more than 200,000 people take the Orange Line each day. A timeline in the Boston Globe said that by 8.15, Massachusetts State Police arrived, and by 9, bomb squads from both the State Police and the Boston Police Department were on scene. The Globe referred to responding authorities as an army of emergency vehicles. Unsure as to the nature of the device, at 9.30, police decided to shut down a section of Interstate 93 and adjacent roadways. I-93 is one of three primary interstate highways connecting Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Vermont, an important route for Boston commuter traffic. A 2021 survey by the website Boston.com found that fully half of the website's readers who commute said they used I-93 every day. Already, the police response was making the news, and news helicopters circled the bridge. The WCBB News 5, an ABC affiliate, first broke into regular programming with a special report at 9 a.m. Reports continued on local and national outlets all day. The bomb squad decided that the best course of action was to blow the device up. They destroyed it using a water cannon, a type of device that uses a shaped charge in a water projectile to blow a device to pieces and sever any detonator connections. The highway was finally reopened around 10.15, having been closed down for 45 minutes during peak rush hour. But the problems were just beginning. Just as events with the first device were winding down, the Globe writes, in quick sequence, just after noon, reports of similarly suspicious devices flooded police lines, sending anti-terrorism forces to over a dozen locations in Boston, Cambridge, and Somerville. The Winchester Star wrote that police sent four calls all around 1 p.m. reported devices at the Boston University Bridge and the Longfellow Bridge, both of which span the Charles River, at a Boston street corner and at the Tufts New England Medical Center. By now, the events were making national news and terrifying many Bostonians. The Globe reported that people reached for cell phones to call loved ones, while others glanced at maps to check the proximity of the devices being investigated by police to their homes and offices. The Globe quoted 26-year-old Bostonian Adam Bastian. What's going on here? No one seemed to know what was happening. 40-year-old Donna Manka told the paper, It's scary. I had friends calling me up, telling me not to come in. While 68-year-old John Reedy said that it really affected him psychologically when he saw the vans go by with darkened windows and the words, Bomb Squad, across the back. Meanwhile, more traffic was being snarled. The Winchester Star noted that subway service was shut down across Longfellow Bridge between Boston and Cambridge and along Storrow Drive. At one point, the city had the U.S. Coast Guard shut down river traffic along a section of the Charles River. Bill Fine, the general manager at WCBV-TV, said, There was nothing that said that this was not a diversion or a prelude to something bigger. Cars were not running on Storrow Drive. Trains were not running. This paralyzed the city for a whole day. Between 2 and 3 p.m., police with bomb-sniffing dogs were sent to inspect City Hall. NBC News reported cable news viewers in this country were treated to hours of live coverage this afternoon as suspicious packages were discovered all over Boston. Roads were closed, the Charles River was closed, and questions were asked about terrorism. But by then, the story was already changing. According to the Boston Globe, the, the first hint came when one of the objects was taken into the dark and something became obvious, which couldn't be seen in the bright sunlight. The objects included a series of LED lights that were showing a picture of some sort of character. Somewhere between 2 and 3 p.m., a Boston police analyst finally realized what he was looking at and astoundingly realized that the culprits came from the moon. The displays on the devices represented moonanites, which the online Urban Dictionary explains come from the inner core of the moon, but claim to have 5,000 dimensions. And the moonanite on the suspicious device was making a rude hand gesture, leading to the question, enunciated colorfully by Fox News anchor Shepard Smith, what is this little light bright looking character thing seen flipping the bird at all eyes which fall upon it? The answer comes from a very strange television show. 
Cartoon Network was created as part of the Turner Broadcasting System in 1992, at the time airing reruns of classic cartoons to which the Turner Entertainment Company had acquired rights, although the network would move on to include original programming targeting children from preschool to age 14. In 2001, the network added Adult Swim, airing 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. Eastern Time, which featured original programming targeted at teenagers and young adults, as the network's regular audience would presumably be sleeping during those hours. The shows were, to put it mildly, edgy and were aired with a disclaimer. Parents strongly cautioned, the following programs are intended for mature audiences over the age of 18. These programs may contain some material that many parents would not find suitable for children. It may include intense violence, sexual situations, coarse language, and suggestive dialogue. Nowhere would that be more true than one of the network's longest-running shows. Aqua Teen Hunger Force officially debuted along with Adult Swim in September of 2001. The show is so bizarre, so surreal, that the website Common Sense Media, which offers advice to parents, says that it might spark a discussion between parents and children over whether a cartoon actually needs a plot in order to be funny. Obviously, images are not in the public domain, but the show's absurdity shows in the main characters, an anthropomorphized milkshake, order of french fries, and a meatball named Meatwad. Despite the show's name, the website TV Tropes notes that the show has nothing to do with water, teenagers, or whatever a hunger force is. But the show does include Moonanites, characters that resemble digitized figures from classic video games and who, among other characteristics, regularly make the rude gesture portrayed on the suspicious devices in Boston. By 2007, the cartoon was doing well enough to support a feature-length film which was entitled Aqua Team Hunger Force, colon, movie film, for theaters. Made on a budget of just $750,000 and due for release in April of 2007, the film's producers decided to engage in non-traditional marketing techniques. The term guerrilla marketing was popularized by a book published in 1984. The website of Moose End Marketing describes guerrilla marketing as a set of marketing actions employed to launch a marketing campaign at a fraction of the price it would typically cost. Guerrilla marketing often features street marketing, outdoors advertising that incorporates both literally street elements and street culture. For example, light up LED representations of cartoon characters placed in public places where they may be recognized and shared by people who understand their meaning. In the case of the Boston Devices, a New York marketing firm named Interference Inc. engaged a local Boston artist named Peter Brodowski, who also included a friend of his named Sean Stevens, to place around 40 magnetic placards that had LED lights that would represent Moonanites around the greater Boston area. The two actually filmed themselves placing the devices, presumably to prove that they had done the work for which they had been contracted, and were reportedly paid just $300 apiece for their efforts. Notably, no one sought a permit from the city of Boston for the placing of placards. The business media magazine, Inc., explains, Sam Ewan found out that the Boston bomb scare, which he'd apparently created while riding Amtrak back to New York City from a meeting in Washington, D.C. The office of his small marketing agency, Interference, called to tell him that the company switchboard was lit up with calls. By then, CNN and other news networks were in live coverage of more than a dozen suspicious devices described as blinking electronic circuit boards found under an interstate highway and in other Boston sites. A bomb squad had detonated one of Ewan's mysterious props, and police were looking for answers. Philip Kent, the director of Turner Broadcasting, was quoted in The Globe on February 1st saying, This is not the kind of publicity we would ever seek. The Globe writes that on the afternoon of January 31st, Kent received a phone call from one of the company's executives saying, Turn on CNN, referring to network coverage of the events in Boston. The Globe continues, The company, realizing that its campaign was probably the cause, went into damage control. The company released an official statement around 8.30 in the evening, reading in part, We apologize to the citizens of Boston that part of a marketing campaign was mistaken for a public danger. We appreciate the gravity of this situation and, like any responsible company would, are putting all necessary resources towards understanding the facts surrounding it as quickly as possible. But by then, Berdovsky had already been arrested. Stevens was arrested sometime before midnight, and both were charged with placing a hoax device and disorderly conduct. They were held the night in a rain the next day, and after being released, held a press conference. But to add to the absurdity of the situation at the press conference, they didn't talk about the signs at all. They only talked about haircuts. Berdovsky started the press conference with, what we really want to talk about today, and it's kind of important to some people, is uh, haircuts in the 1970s.
According to National Public Radio, the journalists that were assembled were not amused. As the story unfolded, outrage emerged. Jack Cafferty of CNN, owned by the same parent company as Cartoon Network, said on air, In a post-9-11 world, who puts cartoon characters attached to batteries on bridges around Boston? Some sort of moron? U.S. Representative Edward Markey told the Boston Globe, It would be hard to dream up a more appalling publicity stunt. Boston Mayor Thomas Menino suggested that the network should have its broadcasting license revoked, saying, Give me a break. It's all about corporate greed. But others quickly faulted Boston officials for overreacting to what was described as a high-tech light bright. A local blogger wrote, Repeat after me, authorities. L-E-D, not I-E-D. Get it? A senior vice president of a Boston-based advertising firm likened the reaction to the panic following the 1938 radio broadcast of War of the Worlds. Boston news reporter Jorge Kiorga noted, You talk to anybody close to college age and explain to them what was found, and they knew exactly what it was. Gwen David worked at a local comic store where one of the signs had been posted. She told News 5, The police came with a bomb squad and the detectives came and it was all very exciting, but added, I didn't feel scared at all. I was not intimidated. I knew that it was a Moonanite. Most people who are going to shop in our store are going to know that that is a Moonanite. The tech website Schneider on Security said, Now the police look really stupid, but they're trying really hard not to act humiliated. When Massachusetts Attorney General Martha Coakley said, The things looked really sinister, had a battery behind it, and wires, Schneider responded, For heaven's sake, don't let her inside our radio shack. In fact, it was later determined that some of the signs had been up for as much as two weeks. It had been noticed by several Boston residents without alarm. A Boston radio personality quipped, I don't think the terrorism officials in Boston are very observant. Good thing September 11 didn't happen here. We wouldn't have found it until September 20th. The signs had also been placed in 10 other major cities, including New York, Chicago, and Seattle. No one raised any concerns in those cities, although all were taken down after the Boston incident. To be fair, the event did occur in context. Boston Police Commissioner Ed Davis noted, according to Boston.com, that as the BPD attempted to make sense of the situation, there were also reports of several terror suspects arrested in Britain, a suspicious package in the Washington, D.C. metro, and at around 1 p.m., a call from Boston Medical Center about a pipe bomb allegedly left by a man who proclaimed, God is warning you that today is going to be a sad day, before leaving the scene. It was almost like we had a kind of perfect storm of circumstances falling into place, he said. By February 5th, Turner Broadcasting Company had come up with an agreement with the city of Boston where they provided Boston with a million dollars to cover the cost of the response and another million dollars as a goodwill gesture. It's a notable sum, given that that's about two and a third times the budget of the film that the devices were intended to market. But the president of Cartoon Network was forced to resign in the wake of the scandal. Aqua Teen Hunger Force colon movie film for theaters is considered to be a box office success, selling about five and a half million dollars in tickets against a budget of just seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. It's hard to say how much of that might have come from the publicity that came, well, from Boston. The charges against Berdowski and Stevens were dropped in exchange for community service. Berdowski, who produces art in the Boston area under the pseudonym Zebler and was an immigrant from Belarus, wrote on his Facebook page, I was a refugee. Thanks for not kicking me out, guys. Fifteen years after the great Boston Moonanite panic, it's still yet to be decided whether it was officials or marketing that had gone awry. And the question still hasn't been answered. Just two weeks later, the Boston Bomb Squad blew up another device that had been found next to a city street that turned out to be a traffic counting device that had been placed there by the city. And just last August, a suspicious package that caused the evacuation of New York's Times Square turned out to be an empty cookie jar. But, of course, packages left behind at the 2013 Boston Marathon proved just how real the threat could be. Officials, the media, and the public are left trying to figure out how to respond to this threat, even when it includes Moonanites, as Bostonian Lynn Walcott told The Globe in 2007. A package is a suspicious package, no matter how cute it is. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the History Guide, short snippets of forgotten history. And if you did enjoy, feed the algorithm by making a comment or clicking that like button. If you have suggestions for future episodes, please send those to our suggestions email box. Check out our webpage at thehistoryguide.net. And of course, we're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can book a special message from the History Guy on Cameo and check out our merchandise at teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes of Forgotten History, all you need to do is subscribe.